And uh, I'm going to turn this into a completed aeroplane. <laughs> That's no problem at all. You're going to clone that, huh? What I'm going to do, though, the, the, the purpose of bringing this is I want anybody that's really interested to just tear a little piece of off and take it home with you. Now, there's a reason for that. It's not, it's not as foolish as it sounds. Uh, I remember in Johnsville, Pennsylvania, the fellow that had won the Nats in 61 uh, had a Dynajet, and he crashed at Johnsville. And of course, the plane was in a thousand pieces, and I ran over and I asked him, could I take a piece? And it was beautifully finished. And in fact, I took about three quarters of the plane. <laughs> the truth was no. And I went home to figure out how he had put that beautiful finish on the plane. And now, the trick in finishing, and I'm assuming this is aimed at mostly the stunt flies, is not to make it shiny. Because if, if all, the only criteria was to make it bright and shiny and pretty and level, well, you could just take it to Earl Shive and paint it with a mop and sand it out. There's really no trick to making it shiny and pretty and fancy if weight is not a consideration, but unfortunately for us, weight is a major consideration. So if you agree, this is actually a part of the plane that won the concourse at the Nets. You can see how this is about three thousandths thick. A human hair is three thousandths. This is about, I mic'd it with my veneer, it's about three thousandths, and in some spots with a lettering on it's five. But if, I'm gonna pass this around. If you wanna tear a piece off, do what I did to the guy in Johnsville and just steal a piece. Uh, for your own reference, and so in the future, if you, if you start building up a lot of weight, you'll know right away, well, geez, that isn't as thick as that. And uh, a, a real quick short story, the way I learned about this, Big Jim had, uh, I had finished up a plane and I, it was really heavy and I asked him what was wrong and he said, you painted it too much. And he made me take a razor out, cut a piece of the finisher off and it was about 18,000 thick. It was about six times thicker than it had to be to be nice. So if you want to tear a piece off, uh, we have plenty of these down at my house. You can come and take it. <laughs> Believe it, it's a whole plane that looks like this. <laughs> and this is what it looked like before the, uh, the unfortunate gods of blow plugs took over. But one of, the, one of the objects at a meeting I'd like to, uh, anytime anybody wants to ask a question, just raise your hand. I think that'll be easier than waiting to the end. George? I want to know who the guy was that picked the pieces from his plane in 61? Fury Jet. No. Joe Cole. I still have it down my house. I said, can I take a little piece? And anyway, I said, sure, take a little piece. I grabbed the rockets, the blocks, the gas. <laughs> I was starting to get the Dynagem when he bought them. <laughs> anyway, pass this around, and you can kind of feel it. Feel free to take a piece if you want. Uh, it was real helpful to me to have that piece of the Dynagem. Because what I always do is I'd, I'd sand it and I'd say, is that, is that like it? And he had letter sets on that thing. Little, yeah, way back do you remember? And I, want, I, I didn't know about lecture sets. Yeah, I said, hey, how would he do this? With a typewriter or with an ink pen? And, and eventually that became like, in I think 62 or 63, the Sunships had the, uh, you know the guy, I don't even know who it is, but I still have parts of that at the house. Anyway, I wanted Joe to bring a fuselage, and the purpose of this is some of the things that make finishing a lot easier is being able to do it in pieces rather than I know there's two thoughts to this. Uh, you can put the whole plane together and then sit around and what typically happens is you keep banging it, nicking it, nicking your elbow and everything. I like to build a wing, finish it up to silver, the tail finish up to silver and finish the body just exactly what Joe has right here. I don't like to put any dope on the body till the wing is in the body. That's my personal technique. Now, what's nice about having the body in your hand, if this was on the plane, well you keep banging into things and you can't, you can't get flat surfaces. So having it in your hand like this, carving the blocks up, and Joe has seen my techniques, I guess, till he's blue in the face. Uh, it's just handy to be able to build a plane in pieces, almost like you would build an RC plane, but then glue it together and finish up the body. And I, what I wanted to do is just quickly get a couple of the little tricks for finishing that I have that may or may not help you. And I know they'll help you if you ever have to fix a plane. Because I have just, in the last year, Bobby knows uh, Jimmy's been going to be one of the victims of the, uh, the Arnowski repair technique here. Anyway, we're trying to develop some ways of fixing stuff that's a little bit better than what we had in the past. One of the things, of course, is just don't crash in the first place and you never have to fix anything. But a lot of times you will have to, and Jimmy's got an example here, I'm glad he brought it. You'll have to repair a problem with it. And what Jimmy had with this, if he wants to uh, elaborate on it, I'll just sum it up. Is he had painted the plane silver, he had put on the white paint, 
and then gone to shoot the clear, and the clear had too much thinner in it. And what happens is the thinner goes down through the white. Of course, the silver will bleed up. Mike Rogers had an orange plane that the gold came through. Rick Campbell had one that the gold came through the red. It's basically from thinner going down. When you, when you spray thinner onto a, a finish, it's not only gassing off, it's going down into the paint. The wetter you put it on, the more risk there is. So obviously, if you have a choice, you want to use the minimum amount of thinner. And I know what happens is it blushes on a hot day. And everybody says, I'll oh, put a little more thinner, put retarder. Retarder is death. Retarder is like putting a gun to your head. Retarder would, will take the sheeting off wings if you put it on to the end. You have to be very careful. So anyway, the, the repair for this plane now, and this is, this is just a typical thing of a plane that has to be repaired. It's we're going to, at some point in time, Jimmy and I are going to get together, we're going to mask off this part of the plane with newspaper or paper towels or whatever to tape. Shoot this part, and if you rub your hand, I'd suggest anybody that's really interested come up and rub your hand over this. You'll feel that it's, it's kind of like a little bit of a washboard. I'm going to try to explain what would be an easy way of filling this in to get it flat again. The sheeting looks real nice. It didn't pull the sheeting up on this at all. In fact, I looked at the bottom, it didn't even pull it up. But anyway, you want to get this surface flat again. I noticed his fillets are a little bit, not that anybody, including myself, have perfect fillets. Uh, but there'll be a way we can kind of straighten this out as long as we're going to go through all this effort. And then, of course, shoot the white. Shoot the silver again, shoot the white again, and then shoot the clear very, very dry. Another choice is if you're not real happy with this, if, if right now, and Craig Gunder is an example, just before the Nats I fixed Craig Gunder's plane, it was in a thousand pieces, and, I, and rather than retrim the plane, I masked it off from the wing back and made the whole plane black. That saves a lot of weight. Now, because you're going to be building up a lot of weight on this, in other words, you're going to have to reprimer it, one of the choices you might want to consider is instead of making it white, a darker color. Again, the colors that come right to mind is black. Uh, obviously, you would then want to put some silver stripes or, you know, but the black will save a lot of the weight of, of having to do this. Um, trying to think of, of other ways that where you don't have to go back, you're actually going to have to primer this, silver, white, and clear. That's four coats of paint. So it's, it's worth it. Now, this is a relatively small plane. Yeah. You, you sure don't want this to come. This is not a pattern master. If this comes out 70 ounces, it's an ashtray. You know, it's, it's Lampion's Christmas present. It's <laughs> so, anyway, I appreciate, that, I appreciate that Jimmy brought this down. Now, the, the one point I want to make is, and, and I consider myself to be the best finisher on the planet of all time ever, for one reason, is I've made more mistakes than everybody that's here in this room combined. Because I'm always trying to outsmart myself on things. And I have gone with the thinner routine, I've painted planes that come out heavier than pianos, planes that some of them come out too light, that yellow one that you have, that one would have been better a little heavier. But it's because I've tried so many different ways that I really feel qualified to, uh, to recommend a way of repairing this. It's not just like some people recommend things they haven't even tried themselves. I've tried, or believe me, and if you don't, you don't think I'm kidding, come down to the house. There's uh, hundreds of gallons of paint in that cellar. Anyway, this will be a, uh, I would say, a two-day repair. Two, two reasonable eight-hour days, and this will be fixed and ready to go. Uh, what happens a lot of times, now a good, a good example, Bill Rich had a problem like this. He was, he was obsessed with the idea, not obsessed, but like all of us, he didn't want to bump the plane out. And he said, ah, oh, Wendy, pulls me up. I went to the body shop. I found this great stuff, high gloss thinner. I said, yeah, you're not going to use it, are you? He said, ah. Oh, you won't believe it. I just sprayed my plane. It's like a mirror. You won't have to buff it out. I'll tell you the number. You can go buy some. I said, no, I don't have to buy it, Bill. I said, wait about an hour and go look at your plane out in the garage. <laughs> he says, then I just hung the phone up. An hour later, he called up and he was, he was like found religion. He said, I have a candle, not a plane. <laughs> Things, the stalactites were coming off. <laughs> it, had, it had melted the foam in the wing. Oh. It had gotten in by the hinges, it puckered up the hinges, it had melted the canopy to where the, the pilot was, you know, had the contact lens. <laughs> uh, but there's an important lesson here. Now, Bill is, Bill, you know, obviously everybody here knows he's from Pennsylvania. He's like one of our kind of guys, and he wanted to share the information with me. And at the time, I was doing something with, I don't know, flying models or something. And I wanted to make sure that as many people benefited from his 
catastrophe as possible. Obviously, we'd like anybody to benefit from Jimmy's problem and, and benefit from my uh, years of mistakes. Um, and that's the only thing that really justifies having to go through the trauma of melting an airplane or uh, just today I went to touch up a stripe on this repair that I'm doing and I said, gee, it's humid out. I better put some more thinner in. I better not. Yes, I should. Yeah. And I, and I put the plane back and I said, nah, it'll be drying tomorrow and I can sand it. I start thinking of, you know, like three steps ahead and it melted. And I've got one stripe that, you know, looks like Route 80 now going down. And I'm going to have to do a major thing to fix it. So, anyway, that's about, I guess, what we can learn from this guy. Uh, I want to go real, real quickly through a couple of things that Joe. Before you finish with that, on the thinner, when you want to get the ratio correct, the same yellow to white on top of the silver, and the white was white. Right. And then he sprayed the uh, clear, so and he had too much thinner. How do you know what's too much and what's not too much? Okay, some of the tricks, and this, these tricks even apply if you work in a body shop, if you paint boats, you paint guitars, you paint, I guess, even houses. You always paint the bottom of the plane first, rule one. You take the plane, you come over to Wendy's house, you're going to paint the plane. You paint the bottom first because it's going to take you. You're going to spray up too thick, up too thick. Oh, a run. Oh, a mistake. Up, oh, a bug flew in. Up, oh, I can't really see that. There's, there's a thousand things that happen before you get the gun just the way you want it, and just when you get it the way you want it, then you want to do the top. Now this year's Nats was unique. They looked at the bottom of the planes. <laughs> Since I won, I can't complain. You know. But up until this year, they hadn't looked at the bottom. And I had told several people, including Jimmy, don't look. You were in the front row, and you had, uh, you know, it looked like uh, oh, the repair of the, the old Magnum gear blocks that come out. Yeah. And so this year, they set a precedent of looking at the bottom. I guess we all have to buff out the bottom. But that plane was buffed out on the bottom, so I guess that helped. Um, but always, I'm just trying to go through tricks that I have uh, learned over the years. Is always do the bottom first. Doesn't common sense tell you to do the bottom first? Nobody here has common it sense. I guess not. Way, I'm not sure you turn it over, it's on the landing, and now you finish the airplane. That's right. That, that doesn't, <laughs> common sense is a hard thing to find. <laughs> I guess it is. It's easier once you have it. Right. Once you don't yeah. have it, it's a problem. You know, no, but that's true. That's true. Actually, I did do the bottom of the plane first. Now, did you see it melting? I mean, did you see a problem coming up, or? I, actually, I did. I, and that's only one coat of clear on the bottom. Mm. I let it dry for a bit. If you, well, once it was dry, you could see. Right. That it, that it actually melted in the, the bottom, too, and some of the silver showing through. The top, obviously, I just put it on heavier, and that created more of a problem. The, the heavier you put dope on, not, now, I assume everybody here, not everybody. There's going to be somebody that paints their plane with SpaghettiOs or something. Most people use butyrate dope as the primary finishing material. Um, if, you, if you understand what butyrate dope is, you'll understand. If you look, if you, if you took that finish that I was passing around, put it with a razor blade and get a, a thousand power microscope and look at it, it looks like ping pong balls. It's porous. If you held that over something and poured water on it, eventually the water would work its way through. It's blacker as a porous surface. It doesn't look porous to the naked eye, but it's, it's the equivalent of having a room full of ping pong balls. So what happens is, the thinner that you put in here, as you smell it, you, a day later you can smell it, right? right. I mean, you're, you're in, a, in your shop, wherever I've been, you can smell, oh, it, now that, when you can smell it, it means molecules of whatever's gassing off are in the air and your nose picks them up. Well, it means that it's still going into the wing. It doesn't only go in one direction. It goes down, it goes up, it goes sideways. So when you paint, typically, uh, and you can smell it, it's still going down as well as up. So if you understand that that's a problem, in other words, with CA, it's, it's a real problem because you can see a lot of times this will be perfect. You spray it and you'll see the wood joints. The thinner actually goes in, swells the wood. The wood has no place to go. It buckles the sheet. A couple of Mike's LJs had the, they were beautiful until he put the last coat of clear and then it was, you know, ripple city. So if you understand about thinner, if you understand the other thing about thinner now, because I worked, I guess, in my own little private business for a while, <coughs> painting motorcycles and guitars and boats and helmets and stuff, I learned about thinner the hard way. I, w I used to go to the body shop and buy 10 different brands of thinner, this was DuPont, Inmark, 
high gloss, no gloss, retarder, no retarder, spot repair. Have them all in the shop. And I find out that every there's no two thinners that are the same. Black of thinner comes in, in grades. I guess if you had a scale of 1 to 10, a hot thinner is a thinner like retarded. It penetrates, takes forever to dry. It can take up to three days to dry. It'll dry with a very glossy surface. A slow thinner like spot repair is made to do repairs on automobiles. You spray it. By the time you put the gun down, you can pick it up and sand it. Now, for our purposes, we have to balance that. You don't want a th you don't want to use thinner like spot repair because when you go to put masking tape on here, it'll pull the paint up. If you ever put tape on a plane and you pull up the paint, you know what you've done is not put enough thinner in the paint. Paint has an adhesion in two ways. A chemical adhesion, the molecules of paint marry each other, and a, and a mechanical adhesion from scratches in the paint or roughness. And if you have either one of those insufficient, when you pull the tape up, you're going to pull. I'm sure everybody here has made a beautiful paint job. You get all done, you pull the paint, and oh my god, there's the you know, piece of chunk. From, and it'll only be little chunks, and it'll always be on the upper outboard. <coughs> the bottom is safe. So anyway, you know, thought one is get, get a little bit of knowledge about thinner. If you, if you don't know anything about thinner, there's a safe way to deal with it. By DuPont V3608S. That's a mid-temperature thinner. It's a compromise between being quick to dry and high penetrating. It'll 99% of the time do exactly what you want it to do. The one time it won't work well, it's not good for cleaning guns, unless it's a little bit too uh, quick drying for cleaning guns. And it's not a good choice to spray in humidity. And I always tell people, and, I, and I'm the best with you all, is it's easier to wait for the humidity to go down, or have a room, run your air conditioner, dehumidifier, whatever. If you paint humidity, what happens, you have to put two to three times the amount of thinner in to kill the blush. When you spray and you see that cloudy, milky white, mm. there's too much humidity in here. What yep. do you usually uh, What about uh, 3602? It's just a little deeper. Mm, yeah, that's a hotter thinner though. See, yeah. what happens now, you can use less thinner. The hotter the thinner is. If you use straight retarder, you can use less total amount of thinner. When you use quicker drying thinner, you have to use more and more and more. So what happens to, to get the same result, to get rid of the blush? But it's easier to get rid of the blush by buying a dehumidifier, typically painting at night. I like to paint at night because the sun will, and it, yeah. There's a lot of ways of dealing with it. Paint in a garage, uh, run a dehumidifier in a garage. Richie Tower had the best setup I ever saw. He had part of his garage walled off with uh, just dollar and a half drop gloss, a fan in the window. When we painted, we shut the garage door, turned the heat up to 90, uh, got got down to our jock straps and painted, and it was great. <laughs> and, and every job I ever did there came out perfect. Two, two concourse winners beside this one came out of his garage. I think pretty much a Dean Pappas, Bob Hunt, a lot of airplanes came out of there. And it was because he had a good environment to paint. That was a tremendous help. And, and he shared it with everybody. I mean, that was the greatest thing of all. What thing did they usually OK, now, if, this, is, this is a question that I love to answer. Everybody comes down to my shop. In my whole life, I've only owned three spray guns. One that costs about $100, now it's about $150 at the Vilvis. That's a quality gun. And two that I, I, I don't even know if they're $10 now. They're really pieces of junk. I got them from in the RC. Three guns. One gun has never had any material in it except clear, dull, clear lacquer. You never put clear in a gun that's had red or blue or green and vice versa. Reason is obvious, and I learned this from Lou Dudka. We were painting Lou's beautiful white plane one day, and Lou only had one gun. And it was time to do the clear. So we took the whole gun apart, cut the top off a gallon of thinner. He made me sit down with a toothbrush and toothpicks and, and all kinds of things. And cleaned this gun. You could have put it on a shelf and sold it as a new gun. Well, my plane came out beautiful. We went to do his right on the upper outboard wing. It spit out a, a, a glob of you would get <laughs> and to this day, I can hear him scream. <laughs> but anyway, at that point in time, the next day, Lou bought a clear gun. And he realized the economy of not having to refinish the whole top of the So but anyway, I only have three guns. I don't have any airbrushes at all. The little four-ounce guns are fine. Uh, the DeVilvis one is really totally unnecessary. Uh, it's overkill. It's like... Uh, 
just you're just spending money to impress your neighbors. It's like buying an expensive car. You still get to work if you drive a Subaru. Uh, when you want to clean a gun. Now, when I had my business, I had a shop in Fairview, and I had these same three guns, and I painted six, eight motorcycles a week, and four or five guitars, and eight, ten helmets, and I had a nice business. And you never take anything but clear for the clear gun. That's clear, and it never comes out. You never leave the gun empty. Either fill it with thinness or fill it with paint, but never leave it dry. There's little rubber seals in there and little things that dry out. Uh, if you're a real professional uh, perfectionist like Mr. Dudka was, you get a gallon can, you cut the top off and use retarder or a, uh, a very hot or a high penetrating thinner. You dump all, take it all apart, dump the parts in, leave them there overnight, take a toothbrush, clean it up. Totally unnecessary. I've never cleaned my gun once in all the time. It'll, it'll form crusts of, you know, like candle wax. And when you, get, when you can't get your hand around it because it gets too big, you can chisel it off. But it, inside, if you leave it full, it'll never, never go bad. Never had to clean a gun yet. Uh, when you clean them with thinner, you better leave thinner in it or the little rubber O-rings and seals, you'll be replacing them every week. Uh, that's, that's another trick. A another question while we're talking about guns. What thinner? What? Retard. What? Retard or oh, the hottest thing? Okay, that's yeah, I yeah. Okay. It, that'll clean the gun overnight. If you use 3608S, it'll take a week to penetrate in and get yeah. all the goop and the chewing gum. And no, what I'm saying is when you get your gun on the job, you're saying you didn't really clean your gun. you got to be shooting something through it. Right, in other words, let's... So what are you shooting through? Are you shooting the retarder through it? Well, I did the yellow today on this plane. I touched right. up a spot of yellow. I left the yellow in a gun. Now, obviously, some point in time, I'm going to have to paint the purple. Well, I'll leave the yellow in until the day I paint the purple. I never never clean it and then wait two weeks to put the... You, you're just adding a step of... Uh, an unnecessary step. And I like to do... If you can afford to do it, retarder is about $20 a gallon now. Oh, and, and it's unnecessary. If you have time, if time is... If you're not doing this for a living, if you're just going to... Like shoot the yellow and then go home. Put put it in a can. This can like this. Just take a, a scissor off the top, drop the whole gun in, and lay a rag on top so it doesn't evaporate. Or I take a piece of plastic and a rubber band. It's a perfect like a uh, whatever. And of course, don't leave it in the house. What I did, Scott Smith will tell you this. Scotty made me up a beautiful Griffin wing, and I had I got nothing heavy to put on that wing to keep the sheeting down. And I really carefully took my can of thinner. Used it for a weight, and I said, oh, that's great. That would be just about the right weight. <laughs> <laughs> I had a cat at the time. <laughs> well, in the, middle of the night, in the middle of the night, I heard one meow and a loud crash as the thinner can went over onto the foam wing. I came down, and I had six sheets of sheeting, and I kicked a can of empty. <laughs> and a cat that was full of thinner. <laughs> what happens when you throw a match at a cat full of thinner? Uh, I almost found out. <laughs> anyway, the poor cat died just before the Nats last year, so I really can't make fun of him. But uh, he lived a good life, except for that one thing, 21 years. I'll never forgive him. I had to order another wing. <laughs> and Scotty felt so bad he didn't charge me for the wing, so I should have just told him it happened. Then <laughs> I got a free wing and sold it to somebody. Anyway, uh, the other thing with, uh, that it seems like most people want to know when they come over to the house, they want to do a spray job or whatever, how much pressure do you use? What kind of compressor? I had the cheapest compressor Sears ever sold. I think it went for $300 25 years ago. It's probably $400 now. Uh, the oil seal is gone on it. You have to put a quart of oil in every time you paint a plane. You have to replace the belt because the pulley's all been boogered up from hitting it with a hammer. <laughs> uh, I have it by a washing machine and my tenant, I left it plugged in one day and my tenant was doing, I have two women tenants and she had a thing of laundry and she was just going to put it on the washer and the compressor's on the side. And you know how they go off? <laughs> 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 that one. She almost had a heart attack. But anyway, uh, I like to spray at 20 pounds. 20, if, if you lived in an ideal world, everything would get painted at 20 pounds. 25 is, I really want to get this job done, but I'm going to trade away some of the lightness by spraying at 25. If you can spray at 15, now Stan Powell told me he did his whole plane with an airbrush, a Pache airbrush, at about 15 pounds of pressure, and he had one beautiful concourse winning the airplane. So it must have taken him. You know how when you airbrush, it takes a year to do a flap. 
but it'll go on smooth. The bigger of a gun you use, use an airbrush, it'll go on one thousandths thick. A, a four ounce couple, three thousandths. Uh, uh, if you use a, a, a body shop gun, uh, you'll be, you know, it's Buick City, man. It's Roadmaster time, man. You know, you can head right out to the Buick dealer and get the Roadmaster details. Uh, the four ounce gun, I, I, I have never met anybody that in an hour can't be using that real effectively and figure out if the uh, paint is too thick or too thin. That always seems to be a problem. How much thinner yeah, the paint? The Vilbus thing, which is what I bought. Mm. Only the Vilbus? Yeah, I have the one you're talking about. Okay. And it's great. I mean, it's Bobby has money, of course. Which no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm fast becoming poor. He makes it because he never pays his bills on time. <laughs> but uh, it's okay, Bob. I'll never mention. But I, I only have the one gun, and he's right about it, cleaning it out. Yeah. And I was running. I ran a whole cup of thinner between these cups. I like to just start playing. Like in about a week, I needed to get. Yeah, feel free to tell the people what you did. But, but luckily. My glob of blue came out under the stick under right. the bottom. I could, I said, It'll wow, I thought a bug flew by. All of a sudden I see, no. wow, those are blue spots. Uh, no. Jesus no. Christ. I'm glad it was on the bottom. No, but it, it's true. If you ever put even one time, and another thing, you know, now here. This is the silver micro flake that the Vilbus sells. Seems like that the Vilbus bits uh, sells. A lot of people like that look. I've had it on a couple of my planes. Glenn Metter had beautiful metal flake planes all along all the time. Uh, if you ever, for some reason, want a metal flake something, one part of your airplane, come over to my house and borrow the metal flake gun. If you take a $150 gun and go put one spoonful of metal flake through it, it is now the metal flake gun for life. <laughs> it never, ever, for all time and ever, will ever be free of metal flake. Now, the way I know is, uh, at one time, Glenn didn't have a metal flake gun. And we were at one time, Lou and Glenn and myself and Jimmy were all like painting in my garage and experiment with Imran and everybody had these great ideas we were going to rule over some world and everything. And uh, what happened is Glenn realized he had painted his plane and cleaned the gun with four gallons of thinner. And then we painted Lou's plane, which was great, and then we painted mine, which was great. We did one of Casals. And it started metal flaking. It, it, and it metal, he had to go home and sand the plane then. We just, it never comes out. I don't know why. You, you can sand the gun down and it'll never come out. So if you really like Metal Flake, I have a gun that I keep, one of my two color guns for Metal Flake. Uh, whatever gun you did that with, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but in other words, that, that is true. Now, Cassie Minato won the uh, concourse uh, two years ago. He had the gold lettering. He had called me up. He wanted to know about Metal Flake in Japanese, and I tried it. Tell him, clean the gun, clean the gun. And he took his concourse winning plan and then tried to shoot the clear. And luckily he was doing the bottom first. Had gold metal flake, they never turned the planes over. All over before he realized, oh, but to go buy a new gun. And, and you have to literally buy a new gun at that point in time. This stuff never comes out. It's unbelievable how long it stays. Maybe this, the, anyone, body shops sell metal flake in squirt cans? No, they might. I don't know. If you could get it in an air, you know, for a canopy, well, yeah. you can live with it. Well, you can always, you know, you can always improvise on things like this. They do make uh, pearlescent paint and spray cans now. Uh, I'm trying to think who, where I saw it. I did see it, though. I know they make the, the, the stuff that Paul Walker uses, that the pink and green, the, yeah. that the kids paint their roller blades. And they and, look. Yeah, they look, right. Who so? Who so? Uh, and you tried the bow. Thing to no, I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Did you use any key? Yeah, I've used them on a couple of planes. It's a little jar, and it has a cylinder above it. Oh, yeah, and you put the yeah, pressed air. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would seem like that would be good for that. That would be a great, yeah, a great yeah. idea. I never thought of that. Now, if you have a fashion airbrush, if you have the airbrush where it just goes through the airbrush, well, you're safe. But in a four ounce cup, there's a, they, they purposely mm -hmm. machine in little cavities and caves where this stuff stays. <laughs> <laughs> And it knows exactly when you flip it over to the upper outboard right. way. You can hear it. Hey guys, it's time. <laughs> it's time. I swear you can hear it at night. Yeah. 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 Now that I know that I, I haven't used any of that pink paint, that uh, the fluorescent paint. 
Steve had all kind. Of, one day, Steve will tell you the horrors of using that stuff. That's going to be the one. Uh, yeah, last year uh, the plain Paul won the Nats with, which was uh, I think eight or ten different colors of pink. Uh, and he said he there was just no end to how many things you know it wouldn't fade. It did this. It was thick. It was thin. It come out. You'll notice on Paul's plane, all his edges are painted black because when you paint that stuff, you can't do an edge. It fades at the edges. Uh, you have to kind of design a paint job around using that paint. Midgley used it. He was semi-successful using it. He had to mix his own paint. Um, but again, that would be a good thing. Buy a cheap gun. It's better to have three cheap guns than one expensive one. Uh, I, and I know Indy RC from time to time has 1995 guns for sale, because that's when I bought mine. And they're perfectly usable. There's no reason to buy anything fancier or uh, more exotic than that. It. And if you if you really have the bucks, buy five of them and put one with white, red, silver, and then never change it. And once you you know, like I don't, I have silver and then it's purple and then it's yellow and then it's. But if you if you had the bucks to set up this way, just hang them up on nails and leave it the uh, the same color all the time. Never change the color. Uh, Wendy. Wendy. Yeah. Joe. Joe. Yeah. What about if he uh is uh straight light culture to you? And let it sit and then it another coat after it dries. Would that have helped the Absolutely. Effect? All right, the best now Jimmy Casal had a good trick. Jimmy used to well anyway, let's let's talk about one thing real quick because this will make it easy. How much clear do you put on a plane? We'll we'll refer to this as a small plane, a pattern master is a big plane. A small plane, one coat of clear, one quart, one quart of thin. Nobler. My red nobler, 33 ounce nobler. One quart. One quarter 3608S, you can add all the thinner you want, but you never add more paint. Now, how do you put it on a plane? And, and let's say this is now obsolete technology as of this NATS, but I'll tell you how I did it. You take the two of them and you mix them in a gallon jar. You have half a gallon in a gallon jar. You shake it up and you go get three gallon glass containers. And you can see it. They're all empty. You pour it in until all three of them have an equal line. You take one of those, which is now one third of two quarts. You can add all the thinner you want, and you paint all the edges. And tip this. Let's pretend this was the plane. All of these edges, just the edge. You don't paint in here. Paint the edge here, edge of the cowling, edge of the gear, edges. All things that'll wear out. <coughs> pretend you're buffing the plane. Where this never wears out. It wears out at edges, right? One third of the total material goes on edges. Letrasets, lettering edges of the canopy, around the spinner, around the, this cowling opening. Okay, now you have two, quart, two jars left. You pour the two jars together and you split it into three parts again. And you take one of the remaining parts, and you, like I said, this is, this is the reason it's obsolete technology, because they look at the bottom of the plane. You put one amount on the bottom, anything you can spray while the plane is upside down. You turn it over, and you have whatever's left is two thirds on the top, and that's how you wind up with a seven ounce finish instead of a, a Mike Rogers ten ounce finish. You know, Mike paints the bottom. Up until this year, nobody looked at the bottom. And I mean, how much could they have looked at the bottom of that plane? Because <coughs> there it is. There's the seven ounce finish that wins. And so, you know, I don't know how scientific that is, but that's worked well for me. And anytime I've tried to put the same amount of paint on the top of my God, I took Bob Gialdini's Stingray and flipped it over one day and all, I couldn't believe it. I said, Bob, what the hell is going on? You don't run out of white paint, did you? I mean, it was silver everywhere. You, it, was, it was more silver than that. But the top was white as could be. And years ago, they never turned the plane over. So that's, uh, now I would guess obsolete tech. Now maybe we'll go to three, four. You know, four jaws and put, you know, three on the top and two on the bottom. I don't know. I'll have to rethink that, uh, the amounts. Uh, For that size airplane, you don't use a half of that one quarter thing? We use one quarter, one quarter clear. A one light quarter. Coat. Always light, coat. another thing, hey. No, I'm talking about 380S. Oh, 380S, half. half. Whatever you use in dope, half of acrylic, half of this amount. This would be enough for this would be enough. But the one you made it, which is, you know, the size of it. Right, that's I a big plane. Three quarters of that. That's more than. Well, you made me stop, but like, yeah, up and I yeah. said, you just put like an awful lot of clear with me. Yeah. yeah, well, this is, when, you, when you spray on one coat of this, you spray it on three coats of light coat. Now, I, the reason I'm saving this for last is we're like trying to 
do this in, in a methodical way. Uh, but we'll talk about this at the end. I just, in the newsletter, there's some stuff about that. Anyway, we've all used light coat. Anybody doesn't understand light coat and super coat, super coat shrinks, light coat is less shrink. But all dope shrinks all the time. Dope is like glass, it never stops shrinking. If you go and measure that window pane with a micrometer, you can tell the age of glass by measuring the thickness at the top and at the bottom. Glass is always moving to the bottom. The same thing with dope, it's always shrinking. It's shrinking in a very small amount, but you can tell the age of a dope finish on a real airplane. They can tell by how much the dope has shrunk over the course of the year or the years or whatever. So when you when you see fillets lifting, and I know part of this demonstration should be about filleting, uh, there's nobody in this room, and I don't even have to ask, that has perfect fillets. There's nobody on the planet that has not had fillets pop up. There's a reason you have a curve. Anytime, let's see if we have, well, we don't really have a thing like with a reverse curve. If you had this kind of curve, where the tighter it shrinks, it presses against the material, never going to be a problem. You could paint the plane with uh, anything. When you have a reverse curve like this, the more it shrinks, it pulls itself away. Well, right in here, as this gets smaller, it pulls away. Now, the way to make fillets better is make them smaller. The bigger the fillet, the more leverage the paint has. If you make eighth-inch fillets, quarter-inch and three-eighth, the bigger the fillet, the more leverage the paint has. Another thing is if you make them, and I know people use epoxylate. Epoxylate, there's all kind of downsides to epoxylate, but it seems like a popular way. When epoxylate dries, it has kind of an oil coating that comes to the surface. It's part of any epoxy that cures. To the surface comes some kind of an oil residue. You can take that off with acetone, you can take it off with lacquer thinners, you can take it off by sanding it off. You can, you can do, and, and when you sand it off, you of course grind it further into the epoxylite, which absolutely ensures that it'll pop up at some future time, like about the day before appearance judging at the NAS. So my suggestion is, rather than use an epoxylite, use body putty. Body putty doesn't do that, it dries in uh, five or 10 minutes. A common ordinary Bondo is just as good as epoxylite at about a tenth of the price. Uh, in fact, Sig just raised the price of it to thirteen dollars for the two little cups. So ordinary bondo. Make make this with a half a prop, a six three or something. The bigger you make the fillet, the more chance there's going to be of it popping up. This plane, and I don't want to go into this right now. I carved the fillets out of wood, a la Harold Price's method of tracing out the wing root, making it a half inch bigger, and then carving it, hollowing it out. And I mean, you know, days and days of work. Uh, the fillets were no better than if I made them out of epoxylite. I did that on a sidewinder and a griffin too. And two out of three times they'll pop, they'll pull up or pop up. Yeah, Joe? Uh, the last three planes I've built that used model magic too. Mm. And I haven't had a problem. Model magic? Okay. Anybody's not familiar. Model magic, they put they buy DAC. Uh, it's a dollar and a half for a can, they put it in another jar and charge you six dollars. DAP is exactly the same as model magic. Uh, only some of that, but it's only the, light the light dap and heavy dap. Yeah, there's light dap and heavy dap. Uh, and I bought Red Devil and I bought like Service Star and four different brands and weighed, you know, took a spoonful out and weighed it and the whole thing. There's no difference. One company, there's some company in Iraq or something that makes dap. And it's like buying gas, Shell and Amoco, they're all the same. I, I haven't seen any difference except the price in dap. Uh, a trick with dap, make the fill up with dap, which I've done, and take thin hot stuff, put it on the Q-tips, and rub it down real quick so that the, the hot stuff is capillary, it goes into the dap, makes it harder, and gives you a better surface to, to stick with. Uh, I remember Bobby uh, did a demo on hot stuff and glass cloth to the wing, and one of the nice benefits if you did a wing, like I think Tommy's son did one of them. Did you, you guys did a, a glass cloth wing with the zap, didn't you? No, we did one with the finishing resin. That was oh, good. with the resin. Okay, but what I'm saying, you could then go right up onto the DAP fill. That's what I thought, and blend it right in. And, but I don't know how, I haven't done it, and I don't like to recommend things I haven't done. Uh, some people, you know, feel comfortable doing that. I don't. Uh, anyway, the you'll get to the point where, and again, when putting the clear on seems to be where everybody has a problem. I like to take two full days, and I like to start a good suggestion to start on Saturday morning. Spray it at 8 o'clock, put it away till 10, spray it at 10, put it away till 12, spray it at 12. Put one coat on, let it dry off. Never put it in the sun. You put it in the sun, 
it. You, you don't want to expose it to ultraviolet light while it's drying because you'll get bubbles. You'll, you'll see bubbles, and especially where the fillets are. You want to put it in the hottest, if it's winter, the hottest place in the house where it's not in direct sunlight. And in my house where there's air heat, I can turn the heat up to 90 and put it by a heating vent, but not certainly not in the sun. Uh, I used to take it, when I do them in the summer, I'd empty my van out, put it in the van and park the van in the sun, and that really worked good. Except the van smells like, you know, a can of dope for two weeks there. <laughs> uh, so, not putting, now Jimmy Cassell had a real good method, and, and certainly his finishes are, you know, top of the line. Uh, he sprays half of it on one day, waits two weeks, sands it all out, and sprays the second half on two weeks later. Uh, and, and I don't see anything wrong with doing it that way. I like to put one coat on about every two hours over the course of two days. And at the end of the two days, <clears throat> now th this is a way of saving yourself some time, is spray all the clear on, and, and I see he's already done it here, and when you have enough to do the last two coats still in, in the material that you're going to use, block sand it out or wet sand it with 600. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that with the sickened stuff. Uh, then the last two coats you can put a very little, maybe a spoonful more thinner in each gun, and put it on with very low pressure, maybe 10 pounds of pressure. Just get it to flat, lay right on there, and that'll save you the most work possible. Yeah. Yeah, now you get to the problem. Now these last two coats, it's humid out. What do you do? Ah, oh, oh my God. Yeah, well, I'll bet you he was wishing he waited. I mean, I wish I would wait it. The job I just did today. Uh, if you can't wait, for whatever the reason is, uh, I think, uh, I'm trying to remember, under $100 you can buy a real good dehumidifier in, in Home Depot. Find some place in the house, like hopefully your wife will be gone for the day, the kids are gone. Put it right in the room, dehumidify the room, put a mask on, paint the whole plane. When you can touch it, take it out of the room. Leave it, even though the room will be all foggy and, you know, you can't see, but you will not pick up the humidity. Uh, if, also, if you have your own compressor, buy a, a water trap that goes without. So usually a compressor comes with a water trap and empty it regularly. Um, the best thing, of course, is if you could wait. And, and waiting, I understand, is, uh, you know, like we're usually building in the winter time, and it's February, and it's, uh, you know, who cares if it doesn't get done tomorrow or the next day. But a lot of times you, you save a day and you lose a week's end and then getting it all, you know, cleaned up. Uh, not, oh, sure. What about the, the, the coats underneath of the final clear? Can you worry about, you worry about the humidity there? Yeah. Or? Yeah. And you don't have to worry about humidity up until you put color paint on. Because you will not, unless you're going to see the silver. Now, on my paint jobs, I usually design a paint job around the idea of having a silver stripe around everything. The reason for that is that my paint job only has a ditch, it doesn't have a mount. If you, if you paint first, now if he paints a silver stripe here, or any stripe, there's going to be a, a line. And every time you sand it, you're going to hit that line. If it's a ditch, you can just fill it with clear and it's no oh, extra work. It's easier to fill a ditch than it is to, to sand down a mountain. So I try to design, you can look at how to paint. It just has a silver line around the lettering. Uh, as part of the paint job, I would do it. Uh, but when, when you're painting the color coat, you have to worry about the humidity. Yes, absolutely. The delta yeah. Underneath the color, it doesn't matter because right. blush doesn't hurt anything. What blush is what happens when it blushes. Lacquer dries from the surface. If you do epoxy finishes, it, it hardens the whole mass, hardens equally. It'll harden underwater. You can paint this with epoxy, put it underwater, it'll harden. No problem. But lacquer skins over, it forms a skin. So if you put the material on too thick, and this is why I say spray with low pressure, you'll always, the, 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 the skin will only go down a couple of ten thousands. But when you skin over a, a giant amount of material, all that thinner is trapped in there. And it's trying to get out, and, and well, as you're spraying, you're picking up the moisture in that, and it's trapping moisture and thinner, the two worst things for the airplane. So. Obviously, the answer is to get rid of the humidity. If you have to live with it, you can try adding some retarder, adding some retarder. But that is really a high-risk thing. And you get into a foam wing, you can melt the foam, you can pucker the wood, you can have the hinges loosen up, the fillets pop, the canopies melt. My, my 82 plane, and I mean that was a beauty. I really was proud of that. 
And I, like two weeks before the Nats, was going to put the last coat of clear on, and I said, oh, this is rah, rah, rah. And I said, one more spoon. One more spoon. And I kept looking at that can of thinner. And said, one more spoon. One more spoon. And I heard the can say, come on, it'll be shiny. And I sprayed it, and it looked great. And I went inside, and I said, let me go look at it. Canopy was a little smaller than it was the first time. <laughs> and the second time I went back, it was like a contact lens over a pilot's head. It was just growing. And so I told the story before that uh, I had to cut the canopy out a week before the Nats make a new fillet, which just what Bobby has to do this one. And uh, the plane did not wind up being in the front row or the concourse winner either, so I was kind of annoyed. And in every other way, it was a perfect plane, but that, that last spoonful of thin I just got. Uh, it's tempting, and, and you'll all, when you when you're doing a dope finish properly, right in here, and right here, and right here, it'll be like 80 grit sandpaper, and you know you've done it right. When when it's smooth in here, you know, oh my, where did that thing go? It's like uh, you know, somewhere in that plane, there's some thinner that's going to have to be there. When it when it's drying right, it should feel. That's why I brought a piece of this. It should feel just like 80 grit paper, all rough, and you sand it down. Now, the next part of this whole thing is, okay, you got all the clear on the plane, it looks great, and, and as Jimmy knows, Jimmy, uh, first time at the Nats, was in the front row with all the big shots of stun, and spent, I'm going to guess, at 100 hours of buffing and sand. <coughs> that's, that's typical old technology, do it the old-fashioned way. If you, you know, all your dope is on a plane and it's kind of rough, there's two things you want to have. You want to have 600 sandpaper, and for anybody that doesn't know, the numbers are on the back of the paper. And the, uh, the yellow backing is 1,200. In the old days, we only had 400. This is going back 20, 25 years. And Harold Price used to mix up a little jar of water with some soap in it, and we'd wet sand a little area, and then we'd take and dry it with a paper towel, and when it was flat, I mean, this is old John DeTavio stuff and then buff it with white compound. Well, yes, that'll still work. It's very labor intensive. It'll, I, I would say the time to do a whole plane could be eight to 10 hours to block sand it all out. Now, in this day and age, there's better ways of doing everything. And one of them is the 600 paper, when you have all your clear on except the last coat, you can sand it with 600 and it leaves very few scratches. On. This looks like it might even be 600 that you sanded it down. It, it has the look of dull, or flat, and very few scratches. You would not want to use this in the final coat if you were really fussy, because it will leave microscopic scratches that you can, I can see anyway. Maybe the average guy doesn't really see them, I don't know. But you go down and get your same body shop supply house, 1,200 paper. It almost feels like if you close your eyes, I don't know what side you're using. Well, that's about right. Now, if you use this with soap and water, very economical, it won't hurt your hands. Maybe in six, eight hours, you can have the whole plane knocked down perfectly, okay? But there's a better way. This is Sickens M600. It's a degreasing agent. Now, I stumbled on this almost by accident. I had to repair a plane. Whenever you have to repair, have, we had to all repair planes. When you have to repair an airplane, the one thing you're fighting every step of the way is the grease and the oil, especially with an old plane. And it's, it's going to have, you know, oh, it's just hard. So I said to myself, I went down to the body shop, and I asked the guy, what's a good idea? How, how can I do this? And he suggested I give this stuff a try. And I had found out after I bought it, by sheer accident, that Jimmy Casal was using it for two years and never told anybody. <laughs> so, so Jimmy, Maybe that's a real bitch. <laughs> anyway, Jimmy confirmed that he was using it and it was a big time saver and I thanked him for never telling anybody. <laughs> I went home with this and I took my little soup bowl, put the piece of 1200 in, took it. And I said, oh my God, that's it. I'm not telling anybody either. <laughs> I said, let them suffer, man. Let them get divorced. I don't care. <laughs> Anyway, that was an improvement over the old way of soap and water by about 10 to 1. You could do now do this whole plane, maybe in a, a foam wing plane, in two hours. But there's even a better way. And the better way is you take a Windex bottle and you take, fill it with this, obviously take the Windex out first. 
And you have a helper. Typically, I have a real neat steps on that he's just great at. And I get him to do that for about two hours. And what you want to do is pick a spot that you want to do. Get it wet. Get the paper wet. As you're sanding, have him spray it. Have your help. You can do this whole wing in maybe in under five minutes. The whole trick of doing it is when you're sanding with microfine paper, you're building up grit in the paper. So what happens after you make three strokes, you're not sanding anymore. The, the flushing action of the material is, is getting away. If anybody's ever worked in a machine shop, you know that the biggest problem when you're cutting aluminum or brass, the tool fills up with chips and you have to constantly be floating the chips away or getting them away some way. Well, it's the same thing with paint. This one piece of paper would do a whole wing panel. The paper is expensive, but you get a lot of use out of it. Two downsides of this, if you're an office worker or if you work uh, like a lawyer or a doctor and you have nice pretty hands, you're not going to have to do this. You're going to have Frankenstein hands. <laughs> and when you get in bed with your wife, she's going to scream that you stink. But it, it doesn't go away for about three days. It really is atrocious. But it will get the, and that's the important thing, it gets the plane done the way you want it. <laughs> You could, you could, I just want to finish this piece before I go on. You, you can get maybe 10 sheets of this paper will be enough to do a whole plane. If you, you'll probably use a gallon. You'll pro the, the reason you don't want to use water, again, water, because this is porous, water is going down. And if you keep sanding on one area, you're going to see the wood pucker. This stuff evaporates instantly. If I fill that cap up with M600 and leave it on the table, in two minutes it's gone. So the bowl used to keep emptying, and I said, what the hell is this? And the way I realized what happened is I went and answered the phone when they came back, the bowl was empty. I looked for the cat, the little cat. I said, uh-oh, problem time, the cat drank the M600. I filled it up, phone rang again, and I looked at the bowl. And I said, saw the cat in the bowl, and I said, uh-uh, it evaporates. And I did a little test, and it takes less than a minute for a, a bowl to evaporate. That's the reason for using a Windex bottle. So, Pete, your question? Okay, after you do that, Okay, you've got the whole plane, pretty much what Jimmy has. Let's just pull it. Jimmy, does this have a, quite a bit of paint on it? Well, it doesn't matter. If you took a little spot, okay, and you sanded it with this. We're not going to go through it. Anybody wants to get high on this stuff? This stuff really has a terrible smell. What is that down there? It can be, if you buy it wholesale, it's about 12, 11 or 12. Retail at 16, I think about 30% on body shop supplies. Where are they? Nah, I never wear a mask when I do it. No wonder why. <laughs> Those are close <laughs> brain dumb. <laughs> All right. This would be what you're looking for is no scratches. Now, the difference, if you can, I just want to show Peter being the difference. This is 1200, this is 600. They're all micro scratches. In fact, I haven't gotten down in this enough to really do it, okay? But if we really wanted to do this, and uh, obviously this is this doesn't have... Do you have any clear on this game? The color so, has clear. The color has clear, okay. Let's do one little spot. Let's probably go right through. you got to keep it wet. You can't let it dry up. Once it dries up, it's, it's history. Okay, the 1200 paper lasts forever. When you're not using it, leave it right in a you know, bowl of water or whatever. I would say that's decent. Now, if you, Pete, I know you're... Why using on Yeah, well, we'll good, I skipped right over that. In fact, I'll tell you what you skipped. You started the clear coat and violet. Well, we, the reason is I want to talk about the acrylic colors. Yeah, what I'm saying is why don't you back up and take the wood off? Yeah, well, this is the part that, because Jimmy's having a problem with it, if you want to feel that, this is 1,200, this is 600. Now, if you have calluses on your end, you'll, you can feel it right away. But but this will buff up, and this is dope, I don't know, dope isn't going to buff up like acrylic, but what I like to do is, anybody knows it's Gorham Silver Polish, you just go to the supermarket and buy it, and don't buy the liquid, buy the, uh, red, the uh, hey, Jimmy Casal is the one that kind of, I guess invented that and didn't tell anybody, I don't know. <laughs> Jimmy, if you're listening, tough. I'm bringing a huge cover for the place to keep it, put the airplane in the floor to dry. A lot of people have these uh, tin sheds in the backyard for 
garden equipment and whatnot? Yeah, they'd probably be all right. That's like putting it in an oven. Yeah, you don't want to make it too hot, though. I mean, a, if you can't stand to be in there, the plane shouldn't be in there. That's a good, a good rule of thumb. I used to make the house so hot that, you know, even a cat would complain. But, uh... All right. Anyway, I'm not... There's a reason. Now, good thing we just ran into a problem that, that Jimmy also has. Okay. You can see how much time was involved in that. You can see your face in it. This is dope. The acrylic is a hundred times better and quicker and easier to use. Anybody that didn't see that, or George, you know, well, I gotta tell you, you should be doing this demo. Obviously, the whole plane would take a day. If you, if you were to do this, and we basically have done it on uh, any, doesn't matter, any color would be all right. If you look real close, you'll see little dots in the paint. Can you see if your eyes are good? I can feel them. The little dots are from spraying the paint too dry. Now, remember I said there's the end of thinners of where there's too much thinner, but there's also an end of not having enough thinner. And when you see little dots in the paint, that's the point. Now this meant you could have went one more. Mm. Because you sprayed too much at one time. You were try what you were trying to do is spray thick material and put a lot on at once. But, but in other words, that's the difference. Okay, a good example. Uh, this is a perfect example. I go to a dentist. I pay him 80 bucks or something. I, he drills a little hole the size of a, who knows, a, a lead pencil pen. And I think to myself, 80 goddamn dollars. I have a Dremel tool home. <laughs> <laughs> that's why you have a dentist. In other words, the difference between having this perfect and having it almost perfect, well, everybody here has sandpaper. But to get it now, if, if Jimmy, and this is why I encourage Jimmy, and I'm sure he's going to take advantage of it, is when he, when the next time he's coming around to paint, is pay a visit over to the shop. There's, I don't, there's probably some people that haven't been to my house. Come over, do it once yourself. Carlos is due for one of these, these visits. And use my equipment and do it once yourself. From that point on, you'll never have to come back. It takes one time to show somebody how to do it. And, and one time to buff this out. Now, buffing it out, like I just did, is a problem. Once you, once you have, one second, once you have the whole plane buffed out, get your best pair of socks and don't use used ones that smell and everything. Okay? Put one sock on each hand, get two things of worms, and just Watch a football game. At the end of the game, you're playing with both now. Socks is a good trick. I think I've already passed that trick on to you. You're all done buffing. There's a product you can buy it in body shops in big quantities for about 15 bucks. It's uh, it's either pink fill and blazes for machine. by 3 3M makes every body shop has it. You can buy little amounts, big amounts. What this does, it has no silicone or wax. When you buy a product. To put over a buffed out finish you want, you do not want to wax the plane for six to eight weeks. This has no wax, no oil, no, it's, it's, it exactly finishes as if you simonized your plane but without silicone That's what I wax. use as the next, uh, this time. Right, the pink is good. The night before with Jimmy, you know? Right, now if you, we're not even going to talk about buffing wheels because I'm going to, I brought this to show anybody. I made an I-beam plane and I decided, ah, all this buffing's got to go. So I made up a little pad at the machine shop and I wrapped it with towels and taped it and I made a thing that I can adjust the speed and I said, ah, oh, that buffing's got to go. And I took my I-beam plane and I did one open bay and I wound up going in. Do the other way. Did the bottom of the plane. Did about three quarters of the plane. It's pretty neat, right? Really good idea. And then I went through. The wing. It catches and goes <laughs> <laughs> and my rudder was there or something. And so I remember Mike, and uh, Glenn of course has done this. Uh, we've all tried the automotive buffing trick, and especially with foam wings. And I'd be buffing away and buffing away. Flip it over, drop buff it over. You need a helper to hold it. And you can get 90% of the plane in, in 15 minutes. And what happens, if you catch a flap, I think Mike had one. He caught a flap and the plane went across the room like the space shuttle and smashed into the wall and, you know, killed the cat or whatever it happened. And, uh, so I suggest it's not that hard to do it by hand, and uh, just do it by hand. 
And if you want to borrow the buffer, buyer beware. You know, Lampion, you want the buffer, be my guest. That's why you you look like a candidate for our video. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it'll work up to a certain amount. I guess we got lucky because we got a lot of confidence. Thank God. We had a show last time. Well, I give you all the credit in the world. I mean, I know what it's like to be 10 days from the Nats and you're in silver and, you know, the whole thing is a real pain. Anyway, just to, uh, to pick up on Tom's point, what about bare wood? Bare wood, and that's usually the part people don't understand. Yeah. You sand with your fingertips yeah. at the final stages. Yeah. Any reason why you don't use little foam blocks cut out of packing foam with, with yeah. uh, paper glued to them for a flat surface? This is one of them I've used. I'm no, no reason yeah. to use it. it. I just like to use my hands. Okay. Basically because I have another habit that I don't suggest anybody try is I always watch TV when I build. If the TV breaks, I can't build. I have to watch a football game and the Giants have to be losing or I can't build. So luckily I've got a lot built in the company. Now I'll generally, I like to watch football games in build. And, and what I'll do with TV, you've been in my shop, it's up here. and I. And I've gotten to the point where I don't have to look. I can tell by feel. But, uh, you know, the buffing and sanding, you can generally, I, I, I relate different than hours. I say, how many football games do you take to sand and buff it over? <laughs> and he, yeah, well, the Giants are winning. Sometimes it goes fast, but they never win. Okay, is, is there anybody, and just please interrupt me if I skipped, and I didn't realize I had skipped over an important step here with Tom. Uh, no, it's interesting in general. I think you guys want to have finishing. You just found them and wouldn't them up. Yeah. Bare wood. Go right through this the easy way. If you don't understand about sandpaper, it's a handicap. So let's talk about sandpaper for five minutes. Sandpaper. I went to do a, a demo for an RC club, John's Club. I don't know the name of it. And I laid out sandpaper on a table like this, and they were amazed that there were different grits. <laughs> and right off the bat, I knew there were going to be some funny questions. And the thing went to 1 o'clock in the morning, and we never stopped talking about anything but sandpaper. Now, I, you know, we're all laughing, but there's people that built some pretty nice stuff with them. You know, basically, not if they knew about 400 Jesus, it could be just awesome, you know. But anyway, rough sandpaper. Basically, uh, this is 80, the number's on the back. This comes Yes, everybody, find a body shop by your house. A body shop, supply house, is your best friend, except for a hobby shop. These things come with glue on the back. You can put them on electric drill pads and make little fixtures and jigs and God knows what. I like to take, these are the top blocks, usually the ones that are a little too heavy to make any parts of the plane. The glue is worn out on this. Stick it right to that. Now, you want to touch sandpaper. You can sand. It's great if you get hot stuff on your fingers. Fingernails get too long. The whole thing. All right. But 80 grit paper to make shapes. You have a square block you want to make round. 80 grit paper. Rough paper. The next step somewhere down the road is 240, 220. Usually with a block. Anytime you use these two, yeah, Keith. You ever use a 40 grit for rough shaping blocks yeah, instead Jimmy, of... Jimmy had a great technique, like you shine shoes, yeah. you put the top block on, take a sanding belt, yeah. like they sell at Sears yeah. Roebuck, and just make it round in a hurry. And I, I saw that one time and I said, wow, that's a great it's idea. It's better than a razor blade. Absolutely. I mean, what would be neat if... If you knew the shape, in other words, my plane has a different shape in the back, and it's got, you know, I can't, but, but Jimmy's planes generally have one shape. Yeah. That is the best way to do it. Yeah, Boom, that's done. Just a rough shape. Yeah, just to and get it round. Out of that, you can find your stuff. Right. But yeah, really well, get you, know, you could use a rasp file, too. A rasp file, I have one, and it works well. I also have a thing that has two handles on it. I don't know what they call it, a smoke shape? Smoke shape. I don't know what a smoke shape is. Drawn but, I got it on Christmas one day. Somebody must have thought I was a coffin or something. And I didn't know what to do with it for 10 years before I realized you could put the top block. And I usually glue the fuselage to the table and include the top block to the fuselage. So now it's, and I can just go. Right. Real quick. Is it a draw knife or a smoke shaft? It's got two handles and a blade. But I just know. the blade. It doesn't have a head on it like no, a blade. No, that's no, a draw no. knife. Yeah, but is that what they call it? Yeah, that's what I realized. My shape has a head on it like a blade. Yeah. But the body shape that I use to make these cardinal planes, it comes to a point, and I couldn't do that with a, the motion. But and if you're doing like uh, a magnet, I guess you could do the nose part. Yeah, you could do. I could even do the front part with that. 
Well, the other thing, uh, if you take these sanding belts, which go from very close to fine, these are the wall pop and right. fine. Right. Take that RC balsa with this one to Make a big sanding block. Yep. Round off the edges and take a 16 inch belt and you've got an 8 inch sanding block. Right, right. Another thing with sanding belts, if you go to see his Roebuck, your wife's probably buying clothes and stuff. Sneak over to the tool department and buy one of every sanding belt they have. They usually are 40, 80, 120, and 240. Buy four belts, they're three bucks each. Find a piece of glass, and somebody here just offered to donate, George Ventrini offered to donate some glass to my cause. Take the piece of glass spray, put spray cement on it, turn the belts over, spray cement them, and put 40, 60, 80, or whatever the, the grits are. Now you got a rough block, go to the next one, next one and go right down. You're done with it, put it under the table. You know, another thing I'm just going to mention uh, in the course of, I was talking to Billy Warwick one summer. Him and I went to uh, Washington State and back. It took three weeks and we went to the Nationals. And in the course of, uh, obviously, he's built thousands of planes and uh, the world champion and everything. Uh, him and I came up with a very unique formula that to build an absolutely beautiful, top-notch, world-class model plane, you need nothing that goes beyond basic, uh, a couple of razor blades, some sanding blocks, an assortment of sandpaper. Uh, you need no, absolutely no big expensive tools at all. And if you have tools, it's neat. If you have drill presses and lathes and uh, electric sanders and belt sanders. But to, to make a really nice model plane, you don't need a lot of expensive equipment. That's one of the beauties of the hobby. Um, there's a point at which, and the point is right at 240 paper, there's a point at which you don't change the shape of the material. And I'll just make this as simple as possible. You have a square piece of wood, you want to make it round, like Keith said with the, the block. 80, 120, whatever number, up to 240. When you start using something below 240, you're not changing the shape of the material, you're smoothing it. You've got to make the shape. There's a, there's, a, there's a concept here that's very, very important. You make a top block, in this case, Joe's must stunt, and you get the shape. That shape is now in the wood, but it's not smooth. From 320, 400 on, you're not changing the shape of the material. You're only smoothing it out. At no point in time would you take a fuselage side and hit it with 80 grit paper. That's what I'm trying to say. A lot of people, I remember, uh, I don't know the guy's last name, he was in the club, Carmen. He used to come over with a beautiful body like this, and oh man, that's great. I look at the back, and it'd be like a piece of paper. I said, what happened? He said, I sand it with 80 grit paper. Well, you don't sand 80, you know, you make the side, and then you're not changing the shape. When you're changing the shape, you use rough paper. But once you have the shape that you want, now, I would say from this point on, this is even thinner. You have to be able to make some kind of little gizmos. This is a wooden dowel, sandpaper tape to it. Arrow shaft piece that you always wind up with a piece that's not big enough for a push rod. Uh, you can take both ends, one rough, one smooth. Just for some ideas to throw out. Uh, somebody asked about foam. Yeah, I have hundreds of foam blocks. And what I like to do is just whatever's luck when you do a foam wing, cut it up into slots and blocks and use it up in whatever shapes. And you'll always find one, it's funny. You'll always find one that's that's like, this is one that just fits your hand just right. It's like, I don't know what it is. It's just, this one has built 15 airplanes, right? And you go make one just like it, and it's all awkward and funny and everything. So this is kind of like a friend. He's been a good friend for a long time. You also always, piece of eight inch light ply with a radius on it, this for getting in certain areas, cowling shapes. Uh, and of course, you can just peel the sandpaper off. Uh, Lou Dudby used to make the blocks out of, I'm trying to remember the material, it was formica covered wood that you could buy at Home Depot, and he contact cement the formica, contact cement the sandpaper, and then when he wanted to get the paper off, put it in the oven at 300 degrees and just peel the sandpaper off with it on it. And they were perfectly flat and he radius the edges a little bit. Uh, I believe if I remember right, he even did a club demo one night, it was very interesting. Uh, so anyway, that basically gets you down to where the wood is sanded. And this, I would say, if Joe doesn't mind, we could kind of pass this around and get an idea. At this point in time, 
Now, my way of doing this is maybe a little bit different than the average guy. They say put three coats of dope on this wood. I like to take light coat, put on 50-50 thinner, and brush on five really thick, drippy, drooly wet coats. There's a reason. The first time you put dope on wood, you establish the wood to finish bond. The bond, five coats. 50-50 light coat and 3608S. And when I put it on, I mean don't put it on, put it on like you're painting a house and let it drool or whatever because what happens is you establish the bond into the wood. From that point on, you're only going to be painting the dope. But you'll never, if once you put five coats of dope on, you'll never get down back into the wood. You'll and those effectively, are 50 50. And just, and I mean wet. I mean let it be dripping and drooling and moving and everything. But that, now you establish a bond between what's going to be on top of this, basically the tissue, and the finish underneath it. Is there an advantage? I hear a lot of guys talking about the order of the gallon itself, the nitrate, okay. the undercoat, that, that this bonding stage that you're talking about. Right. Okay, let me explain. Nitrate dope, and I've done several, in fact, a couple of the concourse planes were nitrate underneath. Several advantages of nitrate. It is about 10% lighter if you use nitrate. You can make very nice filler out of nitrate. You can do every part of the finish up to the silver in nitrate with no bad side effect at all. It is a little bit easier to work with and a little bit lighter. There's one bad downside of nitrate though. It's not fuel proof. What will typically happen is you'll spray the silver on. It'll be beautiful. You'll put the color on and it can be, we're going to talk about the acrylic and dope color. Still, no problem. Everything is cool. It's beautiful. And then the problem comes is if at some point you're sanding this and you happen to nick through a spot and get into the nitrate, that you'll, you'll I don't know how to even describe what happens. It, turn, it turns into like the Grand Canyon and you can't ever seal it. Some of the nitrate starts to bleed in with the butyrate, and when you mix nitrate and butyrate together, it becomes a material that is like yellow gloss dope. It sticks to nothing, nothing seals it. It becomes a major problem. The green plane, I wish I had the green plane here. Uh, the green plane will be at the field Sunday probably. If you look around every cap strip, you'll see little fissures of where the nitrate is coming through, and I've conveniently hid them all with ink lines and paint lines, but they're terrible. It's it's risky. Yeah, it's risky to use any nitrate at all. We use it over fillets. Well, yeah, you could use it over fillets. There's there's supposed to be it'll adhere to epoxylite better. You can use aerogloss. But again, anytime you mix two different brands of material, it's a roll of the dice. And now you don't know who to blame. It's like if you start with SIG light coat and you go right through to the final thing in light coat and there's a problem. You can always identify the problem. If you start with a typical old technology thing, you paint the glue on the wood, and Schaefer, I guess, came up with that idea, and paint the glue on and cart it off and then sand it and then auto primer it. Well, somewhere in the thing you have a problem. Where in God's name do you find who, who's to blame here? You can't you go you can't call SIG, you can't call Aerogloss, you can't call anybody. What, what I like to use and I suggest, like Carlos and his son, if you come to the house and you use all SIG. There's a chance, a real good chance, we're going to get a real nice finish on the first shot. If you start mixing aero gloss with hobby epoxy and this and that and auto primer, somewhere down the road, if there's a problem, we got to call Ghostbusters. We got to call Carlos Busters. Like, you know, it's going to be tuned to pipe heaven if you have a problem. And and so I suggest if, if you're in a learning curve at the bottom where you just want to have nice finishes and you use all light coat, almost every time you'll have a really nice finish. Now, there's one exception to that rule. Light coat only comes in, what, 15 colors, 12, 15 colors? And where's Wayne? Wayne came up to me today with a suggestion. He had a, a book and he wanted to match a color. He says, oh, you know, obviously now light coat's not going to match this very, with a P39 and air cover yellow. And I, I wanted to explain to him about acrylic lacquer. Acrylic lacquer is, <clears throat> Made by every Inmont, DuPont, Ditzler, it doesn't matter who makes it. If it says acrylic lacquer, it cannot say anything but. It cannot be, and there's 50 other substitutes. Centauri, acrylic enamel, Imron, they're all not applicable. Acrylic lacquer is the material we're talking about. Acrylic
acrylic lacquer and zinc dope you can mix together. You can paint over, under, around. You can put lacquer, sig, lacquer, sig, la all through the paint job. It doesn't matter. Uh, you'll find out that this material is heavy, but it always covers in one coat. It always comes out with a very easy, predictable way of using a material that you, you don't get surprises. If you use SIG and acrylic, you can assume you've used all SIG. Okay? Now, the beautiful part is back to Wayne's thing. This material comes in an endless supply of colors. You go to a body shop supply and you say, uh, Mr. So-and-so, let me see the color map. Anybody here that doesn't know what a color map is? Uh, color map looks like a big piece of Swiss cheese. It's a book of about 50 pages. And each color has behind a piece of Swiss cheese a different variation of the color. So Wayne, you would go to the yellow page, go maybe to the third yellow page, which is orange yellow, and say, hold that piece next to the Swiss cheese, and it, it would just, you'd, you'd find exactly the color. It would have a, a number that they would punch into the color mixing computer, and you would get exactly that color in acrylic lacquer. Now, if you didn't want to use acrylic lacquer, for whatever the reason is, if you said, I want to stick with all sick dope, still no problem. You go down and you ask the guy at the body shop to mix you up a pint of the color and Wayne wants, and the number might be like 3807 whatever. He punches in a computer, and you hold the can there, and you take only the pigment, don't take the carrier. All paint is made out of about 80% carrier, and 10 to 15% paint and some other ingredients. You just take the pigment out, put it in SIG clear, and you now have SIG in 14,000 different colors. Okay. There's another variation of this. If you want to have a real fancy candy apple color, like my color was purple this year. I had blue, I had red. Okay, you go down and you buy candy apple acrylic lacquer and put it over six silver and you, for all purposes, have a plane that has no color paint on it. There's no pigment in candy apple paint. There's a dye. The dye is $80 a pint if you want to buy the dye and mix your own sick paint. <coughs> Very expensive. So it's much cheaper to buy the candy apple paint already mixed. Okay, the acrylic clear. Once you put acrylic lacquer on a plane, you may as well finish with acrylic clear. Acrylic clear, you will need probably two coats the most. You put one coat on, sand it down with 600, put the second coat on. If you really want to go for the concourse, put the third coat on. Figure out that whatever material you use in this, this is going to be three coats to one. One coat of this is three coats of light coat rough number. If you put this whole quart on a plane, you'll add three ounces to the plane. You'll probably buff and sand it down to two and three quarters. This will add three ounces to a plane. I guess that's a bull. I could have driven clear Okay, but there's a reason. Because now you've got the wood, you've got the five coats of clear on it, you have to make a decision. This is why I didn't go to this first. You have the clear on. Now there's several chains of thought. Right now you can go one of two ways. Auto front. Five coat. And in Wayne's case, I would say if a guy's building a scale ship, uh, weight is not a consideration. A pattern mask. No, before paper. Okay? If weight is not a consideration, if you're making a uh, Navy carrier plane, a scale plane, well, you don't care about two or three extra ounces. Go get a gallon of auto primer and put on 15 coats of auto primer without sanding until you can't see the grain in the wood. Okay, and I've even done this on profiles, Don Patterson's profile. Just buried it in auto primer and sand it down until you see the first hint of wood, stop. Go paint it with acrylic lacquer the same day and from 8 o'clock in the morning to lunchtime, you finish with the finish. The downside is it's going to be very heavy. It'll be a typical profile will be 12, 15 ounces. So that's not a good choice, but it's a choice for scale people. And, and you gotta understand, half of the people here don't build stunship, they build scale or maybe carry it. Okay? That's very quick, easy, bingo, and you're out of there. It would be good for RC planes where weight is not a primary thing. Stunship, weight is a problem. Eliminate the paper step another? Totally eliminate everything except the five coats and go right into auto primer. Just dust them down. Did I add the strength or did it no strength? There's no strength on a scale plane. I mean, relative to a stunt ship, strength to weight is not important. But a lot of times, you want to build up that material. And the reason I say this is a good trick now, on my repair job, I have big holes where the 
the paper used to be, and I want to fill them. Well, I can fill them with auto primer. I mean, in one day, just shoot every five minutes until it's the level, lock, sand it down, it's gone. A repair, it's okay. Weight is not a consideration when you repair. Weight is only a consideration when you do the whole plane. Now, if you want to go to the stunt type of finish, stunt type of finish, you have five coats of clear on here, and dust sand them off. Double O paper is my choice. Some people like medium. I think John DeTavio uses medium. What about in the open base? Medium on all open bays, no double O. Double O means you're gonna you're gonna raise it through a cap strip, and you, every I, I can't do it anyway. I, I just every time I go through the corners, medium, and I and heavy, which I've done. Heavy is always like, why did I make this so heavy? You know, yeah. I, you need 80 ounces of paint to fill it. Medium is really the best choice uh, from a strength to weight point of view. Now. In this case, and I, and I just did this on last year's plane, and it doesn't work, so I'll share a nice mistake with you. I got real cute, and I said, ah, here's my beautiful body, my top block. I said, I'm going to beat the system. I took the whole body, the wing and tail weren't in, and I tissued it and brought it up to silver while it was a fuselage. And it looked great, and it was absolutely beautiful. And I put the wing and tail in, cut the bottom out, put the whole thing in, went to put the top block on, the top block was smaller than the fuselage. Because it... As it was disassembled from the plane, it shrank in the two or three days that it took to do it. The block wasn't as strong as the body, and the block just kept getting smaller and smaller. So consequently, I had to re-sand out almost the whole thing and do the whole job over. And it was definitely a mistake. So if you if you choose to do the tail and wing up to silver, leave the body raw wood, and then just assume you're going to start and do the body in one strip. Now, tissue in the body, I'll bet you everybody here has a different way of tissue in the body. My favorite way used to be I would cut postage stamps, and I would paint the nose and just do the whole plane as if it was going to Poland with stamps, and just, just let it dry overnight, put three, four more coats of clear, two, three coats of filler, sand it out, you'd see every edge. But after the third or fourth time you sand it, they're gone. Now, Lou Dutke used to try to make it in maybe three or four pieces. He had a nice way of doing it. Uh, Mike Rogers, I've watched Mike do it. He, had, he can do like half a body in one shot and pull out all the wrinkles. You're basically just covering the whole thing. The reason for doing tissue on a stunt ship, the tissue adds tremendous strength. Jimmy found this out the hard way. Monocoat does not add strength. You monocoat something, it's basically just as strong as before you monocoat it. It adds absolutely no strength in monocoat. If you tissue this and shrink dope it with maybe two coats of shrink dope, because it's always under tension, especially in open base structure, you'll always wind up with a very strong, very light, very nice structure. So basically then, if we're going to do the tissue finish, the five coats, I dust sand it, somehow tissue it, five more coats of clear 50-50, seal everything up. Now there's a choice. If you want to mix some talc in here, if you want to use one very thin coat of auto primer, there's, there's choices and variations. If you make filler coat, put talc and a little bit of blue or green so you can see where you're sanding, that's a good trick. Uh, you've got to bring this up to where you have what's called a substrate. A substrate means everything that's under the colored paint. If you were working on a car, it would be the red lead, the body putty, the whatever, and the auto primer. And you cannot paint over raw metal. You have to paint over a substrate. The word in body shop talk is substrate. And for our purposes, the substrate is going to begin and end with the silver paint. Now, the reason we like to use silver SIG paint, no substitutes, not gold, not white, not blue, not black. SIG silver has a very, very microfine ground up aluminum powder in it that reflects the light much brighter than any other color, including acrylic silver. So that when you paint a, what you think is a beautiful flat surface in silver, we all know what it looks like. All of a sudden it turns into Pockmark City and Phyllis look awful and everything. The purpose of the silver has always been and always will be to show you the mistakes so that you can then correct the mistakes. Typically I spend a week sanding silver. I'd sand six, seven hours a day for a week. I'll Put it on, come back in the morning, sand it all off. Put it on, come back in the morning. That four or five times, and each time it'll get nicer and nicer and nicer. At some point in time, 
you're satisfied. Now you can be satisfied when it looks like, you know, this floor. Or you can be satisfied when it looks like that piece of finish that I passed around. Dry or wet. Okay, now here's where we go back. And this is why I didn't go through this and then end up. <coughs> Same material, when you sand silver, if you have a very chintzy finish on here and you, you are prone to go through, like if you have very strong hands and you're, you're really going through, while you're still going through, you don't want to go near this because this will get in and pucker up the wood. It'll be better than water, but still, if you feel you're still going to go through and see wood, if you can see the wood coming through the tissue, you don't want to use anything wet. You want to use dry 400, 600, some, some material that you sand dry and throw away 100 sheets. As soon as you have it sealed and you're confident that it's not going to go through, you can do the same routine and you can sand out the silver exactly the way you do with that. And you can sand it with 600, not 400. And that lets you get the whole plane down in maybe two hours. So, the, the trick here is, I'll write that call. The trick is the Windex bottle and get a little area at a time and wipe it off. Little area, wipe it off. Little area, wipe it off. Don't try to do the whole thing because you're letting this material get wet. You want to really do one little area at a time and, and it'll come right off. Believe me, you'll be dead. If this is silver and we go, we're done. Wipe. Next spot. Wait, this is instant. This is not like the old days. Now, in the old days, this is what happened. Old days, I mean, I don't know what. I, I thought I brought a piece, but maybe I didn't. This, this gets clogged up instantly. You sand silver, and it's useless. And it picks up little balls. Anybody's ever got the little, the little I don't know what you want to call it. Looks like you blew your nose in it. And you rub that, it puts nice little grooves in. Oh my God, you want to die. Anyway, I don't even have any here because I don't. I haven't done it in such a long time. Uh, all right, here's one. Picking up, picking up the stuff from sanding the tip, the uh, the filler. Yeah, Paul. I've heard you can use it, and I haven't. I mean, I have no. I haven't had a reason for it. I'm sure you can use it. Though. You can get steel wool that is so fine. Yeah, you can get 40302. And, and what's, what's nice about it is, unlike paper. Jimmy, can you get me some while you're going there? With some ice. Okay. Thanks. Unlike paper, you have less chance of, of uh, putting a, a scratch or putting yeah, a real true. dig in the, in the finish. That's absolutely true. The reason, I, and I remember this from motorcycle days of, of steel wool and things, I'd always wind up with underneath my fingernails, it would be like, you know, Viet Cong torture getting out the splinters and stuff. But I'm sure, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's a technology that you could use that would be just fine for all purposes. Steel wool, anything that's going to that's gonna take the material and make it flat is just fine. It doesn't really have to even be sandpaper. If you can figure a way, steel wool would be a, a good substitute. Another thing, oh, I didn't bring it. 3M makes what, what you probably see in a store as a uh, it's green, gray, and maroon. It's little sponges. That's it's made out of fibrous nylon or something. Now I've heard other people. Okay, Scott. I've heard other people tell me that you can sand silver with that. I haven't tried it. But when Lampion brings his plane over, we'll give it a shot. Uh, we'll be glad to use your plane. That is another thing here about about wanting to try some of these things. It's always nice if you have an old plane. Uh, and that's why I'm saving these pieces of finish to try some of this nonsense on. You don't want to take, like, here's Jimmy's good plan. Oh, let's try, uh, you know, some new brand of paint we never used or thinner or whatever. Let's try it on an old plane. It's always good. Always try it on the bottom of the outboard wing that nobody will ever see or whatever. Um, always a good idea to have an old plane. Or if you, if you see a crash, another good thing, in which we all see from time, run over and steal a tail or a wing. So you have a little guinea pig thing to go try your finishing stuff on. It's always a good idea. You don't have to use your good, you know, P51 or Mustang or whatever to try this stuff on. Yeah, Tom? Open vein. Do you need to fill? No fill? Okay, good question. That's why I asked. As maybe the people in the room have never seen the Nobla tapes, but I really, I spent a whole tape describing. Open bay. You get to where the cap strip is here. You do the cap strip and an eighth inch on each side with filler, but no filler on open bay. When you do the 
the dope on the open bay, you go up over the cap strip by an eighth of an inch, and you do the filler over the cap strip. So that exactly where the cap strip ends and the radius is, you probably have eight to ten times the amount of paint as on the rest of the plane. And then when you rub it out above it, we don't have an open bay plane here, do we? Uh, you would have a radius of paint. Otherwise, you're almost always going to go through the cap strips. Every time you sand the buff, first thing you see is F1, F2, right away. Or does anybody have, obviously, this, you know, any questions that you have? Oh, two other real quick things. Busso gave me this great tape. I think we won it as a door prize at the, I don't know. Anyway, it's made by uh, Livingston Tech Tape Manufacturing. Came in all different grades, and still about 10 things in the pack. I wound up not really being comfortable using it. One of the tapes, and I don't remember which one, pulled the paint up. The other one came up, and I couldn't get it to stick down well. I, and I really, I thought Busso would be here tonight. I was going to ask him what the deal was. Uh, for, for all the purposes we have, this is the stuff I like to use. And all my planes are done with the uh, fine line. Buy it again in a body shop. Oh yeah, this is all right. Tom's got one here. Uh, I brought it because John Misk is going to stock it back. John Misk promised body shop supplies will be available at John <laughs> at 40 off. <laughs> well, call the ambulance. He just had a heart attack. <laughs> Quick, I see he fell on the floor. Now, you might say, yeah, I want to pass this around. Wendy, Wendy. Wendy. Busso yeah. says he uses the drafting tape. Yeah, says it's okay. Less, less tacky. Besides this, three, I just came back from Body Shop before we left the mask. Right. Three Amos came out with a new one. Blue. Yeah, yeah the blue one. It yeah. goes from more curves. Right. So it's it's a curves. smoother material. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm going to pass this around. Maybe some people in the room have never seen this. This is called striping tape. It's made by 3M. If you look real close, you'll see there's about 12 little stripes in the tape. And what I do with this, if you look at this, Bobby, you can lay the whole tape out. I can't do it because I have a piece on here. You lay the whole tape out on the plane, and then you can pull up the middle stripe. So you put three stripes or eight stripes down at once. Just pass that around. And anything anybody wants a fondle up here. Look at that. I haven't had good luck with this tape. I tried it, and... I really have to talk to Steve about what the trick is. There might be a trick. He, he turned me on to this, and I was not happy with it at all. And I might be that you have to... Yeah, well, I had it coming up in the corners, and I was... I really, you know, I'm not going to say it's bad tape, because maybe the way I use it is wrong. Maybe the scale guys use it or whatever. But it's one of the things. There's another thing. If you use any paint at all, every single batch of paint you make, Put a drop or two of fish eye killer in. Fish eye killer kills surface tension in paint. Can you put too much in? No, you can put the whole jar in. It. But one drop is plenty in every little batch of paint. Okay? Every person here has oil glands in your hand. And even if you wash your hand, in three minutes you have microfine little grease and oil in your hand. But the Puerto Ricans are terrible. And if you're Italian, man, Greece City. Anyway, Greeks, you're not allowed to paint. You've got to run a rest of them. Right, but the purpose of this is this, this will kill the surface tension. You won't get the funny little moon craters and footprints and fingerprints. It's real cheap to buy. You can buy it in a body shop in a quart can for like $18, or you can buy a little supply of it. This, this is a lifetime supply. You never need more than that. Flexool, made by Dave Brown. Now, what Dave Brown has done is taken a very expensive material that body shops sell for probably about, if I remember the last time I bought it, in the neighborhood of $40 a quart, and put it in nice little convenient $3 bottles. This is all you need to do a plan, the $3 bottle. This material, if you put it in and it says right on the back, acrylic lacquers, acrylic primers, and butyrate dope. Notice it doesn't say nitrate. Don't put it in nitrate. It's not going to matter. It tells you to put a teaspoon in for pint. A te per two, pint. Two tablespoons per unthin pint. I put in five times that amount and not had a problem. The, what this does, the way they developed this, this was developed by body shops. They wanted to be able to when they, when they take used cars, 
and they want to be able to paint dashboards and slip covers and things that bend. Corvette bumpers, the front end of Trans Am, we are made out of rubber. They develop this product and it's full flexible, flex agent. And you put this in paint so that the paint now matches the bumper, the steering wheel, the headliner. And the guy demonstrated this one time. He took a, a, a seat cover from like a, uh, you know, a car and he spray painted it. And then he put some of this in the paint and spray painted the other side. And you take this side after it dries, you do go like that. The paint just plate falls off. And on the other side, it's rubber paint. It has, it has all the characteristics of the paint, but it's rubber. It, it's flexible. Yeah? I, I painted a plane with a color black, but when you get the pine can from the automotive dealer, when you read it, it says to use this flexing agent, it was a DuPont material. Yeah. And, and the ratio is very high. It was like one third. Right. Some, you know, a real high number. Right. So I went and I bought that particular material. like 16 bucks for a plane. It's expensive. Flex, yeah. Flex stuff. I know. And I, I used that ratio. It worked out real well. But when I read the can, I was sort of intimidated by it. I was sort of reluctant to use the Dave Brown stuff because I was concerned it might not work. Well, but what I, you're saying is it, 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 you use it with the acrylic, right? Yeah, I've talked to Dave Brown about this. a lot less than what he was saying. Because I'm a dealer for his products, and I've asked him specifically, what is, what is, you know, what are we selling here? Yeah. So if somebody asked me, I would know. Okay? And he basically buys it in 50, I guess, 50-gallon drums, puts it in convenience. Because obviously, you and I are not going to want to go and buy a five-gallon can. It's a body shop wood. But this... This material allows us to use, if we didn't have Flexol, this would not be useful for a stun chip because it would be too brittle. Now, the person that originally, and in fact, the original way that I found out about this is Ted Fancher had a plane at the 82 Nats, and a silk span, an I-beam wing bends, and he cracked the silk span at the body. And I said, well, how, how did you do that? He said, I used acrylic lacquer. And I said, well, did you put enough flex, Flexol agent in it? And he said, Flexol? And I knew. And, and by the end of that season, that plane was cracked like glass in a lot of stuff. We called it the tape plane. He had scotch tape holding things on. But he learned a valuable lesson, and he was willing to pass it on to the other people. And I had, at that point in time, written, I believe it was a flying model, something about putting this in the paint. Now, it turns out, SIG, there may be a history lesson here for somebody. I have found out through the grapevine, SIG at one time used to be Randolph Phillips. They, at another point in time, Kodak made the ingredients for their paint, and they now manufacture their own paint 100% in-house. That's the word I've got. Now, what it means is that I, I, if anybody goes back about three years, we used to buy gallons of light coat, and they you put one drop of 1% nitro on it, it would turn white. Anybody, I'm, I'm sure, had that happen. They used to skimp on some of the very expensive ingredients that are supposed to fuel proof the paint. That has supposedly been corrected. And any night, any any new light coat that you buy, and I guess John's when he gets his store stocked up with light coat, will be buying. I don't know if there's even a way you can tell if there's a date on the can, but I had two or three old gallon cans, and I just threw them out. I didn't even want to sell them because they basically were from from the time that they really had a fuel proofing problem with sick. Uh, it, it isn't worth, in my case, doing a plane or selling it to somebody. It's going to ruin a plane. It's cheaper to just throw it out. Uh, this material is about as fuel proof as SIG dope. It'll take 5% nitro. Yeah, you put 10 on this, it's going to turn white. So what I tell people is, paint the plane, put all the clear on, and before you do the last sanding and buffet, bring it over to me and I'll spray the nose cowling and underneath the nose from about here forward with a spoonful of Imran. Mike's plane is Imran in the front, the uh, wall of mine on and that kind of fuel proofs it if you don't rub through the end. And that gets rid of any white that you have anywhere on the plane. Because you never get raw fuel anywhere except really on the nose unless you spill it. Well, like I'm prone to do, because I have this really neat hole at the top of the cowling here to let air out. And I always turn the plane over. And then I take the engine out. And then the fuel tube will always have one drop of 10% nitro. And it'll always go right through the hole. It can go uphill. This is proof. It goes uphill and through the hole. Out runs down the top block, down the canopy, down the rudder, and then you have a major repair. And it's happened to me so many times that now I always put a little piece of Kleenex in there, turn it over, and the Kleenex always gets wet. It's amazing how it can go up. Unless when I uh, when I 
Remember when I lost the uh, tip wave box? Uh, yeah. Box yeah. I turned the airplane over the car and it didn't cap the gas tank. There's always some left in there. Oh, there's always a drop. Well, I guess in I, a month. I have like a quilt in the back, and part of the back it must be nylon. Maybe the way it was good, I wiped it in. <laughs> because the, when I took the airplane out of the car, the quilt stuck with it, literally melted. The nitro melted the nylon to the top line. Yeah. And I now have two blue spots where I pulled it. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's I've amazing. I've seen that with the old people. I saw it happen at Jimmy one time at the field. Uh, we, were, we were working on his new pipeline, and we flipped it over, and it was, you know, the, the pressure line is a foot long on a pipeline, and there was a whole, like, an ounce of fuel, and it all ran right down his top. Anyway, it was, I, I know how he felt. It's just like a major pain in the ass. With it, speaking of Jimmy, how does he get away with all his planes, are, you know, the base is white? That's all aerogloss out of the spray can. I know for a fact that I've been in the base camp and I see all the spray cans. Well, you can put all the SIG you want over aerogloss. You just can't put aerogloss over He says sick. he's done it both ways. How's it doing? Well, okay, here's another. This is a good point that you brought up. Here's exactly what's happened. And I've seen Jimmy spray SIG silver out of cans. Keith probably knows, whatever. If you spray any material really dry, and, and Imran is a good one. I used to do all Imran planes at Richie Towers. Imran is made to go over lacquer, but you're never supposed to put lacquer over Imran. If you take an Imran finish and put lacquer on it, it melts it. It's the one thing, it's nitro proof, it's not lacquer thinner proof. Though. So what I wound up doing is when I wanted to put lacquer on top of Imran, is painted on bone dry. And spray cans really don't have a lot of thinner. There's not a lot of penetration. So my guess is, what happens when Jimmy does it is he sprays it dry, and he's very careful about doing it. He probably has a good technique. Yeah, Keith. Well, he was spraying the aerogloss because it was so white. <laughs> that was the reason he was using aerogloss. He liked it. Aerogloss probably has more well, pigment per quart or thing. Yeah. Another point we'll just mention about pigment. When well, you go to anybody, you're right. You got any body shop supply, the guy's going to make paint. There's no such thing as in this day and age as paint that comes mixed. There are quarts of clear paint. He puts it in a computer and he punches in a four or five digit number. The computer goes doo -doo 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 -doo, and mixes the paint and then they put it in a machine that shakes it. That's how all modern body shops work. But yeah. One, the one thing he did when he sprayed with the aerogloss the can, he had the light reflected across the wing or across the body. So all he was he was watching for was the dampness on the wing. Right. He wasn't looking down at it, he was looking at it from an edge. Oh, yeah. So he was basically spraying. spraying very, very carefully. Yeah. And, and so it's just a reflection that he worked a lot with to make sure he didn't get too much on there. Right. Now, what I did at one time, I had trouble. I was making a lot of white airplanes. And I said, this is belonging to this one. I took a can of SIG, at the time was uh, Randolph. Went down to Randolph, took a can of SIG to Randolph, and I said, how much of this material is actually pigment? And it's supposed to be like a trade secret. But very little of it, maybe 8% or 9%. It's, it's, if you let it dry long enough, there'll be a, an eighth of an inch of pigment in a can. And I said, well, I asked the guy at Randolph, I said, what's going to happen if I took two cans of, of white and I poured off the clear so there'd be twice as much pigment to paint? He said, no problem, but the paint will be like $10 a quart more expensive. I said, well, I don't care how expensive it is. What happens if I take three cans and put the pigment in? And he got what I was, you know, the point I was trying to make was we don't care how much the paint costs if it's not outrageous, but you really wanted to cover it in one coat. And I started out, Glenn and Lou used to decant paint. They'd let it sit on a shelf for a year, pour off all the clear, and then use a little bit at the bottom. Uh, with white, that can be a real pain in the neck because you have to buy five quarts of white and you throw the paint away, you only get one quart of white. So what I finally wound up doing through the body shop that I do business with, I asked him, would he sell me the raw pigment? And it's apparently no problem at all to buy raw pigment, which I didn't know. You have to throw away hundreds of quarts of white pigment. <laughs> so now what I do is I buy a gallon. A gallon of white pigment is $136. I doubt that there's many people who want to shell out $136. It only comes in gallon cans, as far as I know. And you can basically buy small amounts either from me or go buy a can, get five guys and split a can. Uh, and I like the, the ratio that I found to use the best is to take eight ounces of paint, eight ounces of thinner, that's 16. 
and put four ounces of raw white pigment in it. That gives you 20 ounces. 20 ounces, you can add all the thinner to that you want to spray it because it will be relatively thick. That's plenty to do, even a big plane. In this case, you should have paint left over. Now, I always paint the trim first and then mask off the trim. In this case, is there white underneath all the other colors? Okay, you can see one third of this aeroplane is white and then red and then blue and then, well, if you were looking to save weight, which we all are. Now, even if you didn't want to save the weight, what it would mean is you could put more clear on and still have the same total weight. So, if you can design your paint scheme to do it that way, and obviously you can do it both ways, uh, you can save some weight that way too. But you can add the, you can add an amount. Now I've I've gone and really gone crazy with this pigment and tried to spray like almost straight pigment just to see what would happen. What happens is there's a point at which first of all the pigment really has a horrendous odor. If you put extra pigment in the paint, you will really get you'll just get physically sick from breathing it in. It, it has a, like a, a dead cat smell. <laughs> I am. But what I'm saying is I've really, I've You're gone... You're supposed to keep the cat if you approach. I've gone and uh, try, gone to the point where there's too much pigment in the paint. And what happens is if you pull a tape up, it'll pull a paint up. You don't get any adhesion. Uh, I, I then went back down to what I thought was a, like a human ratio of 4, 4, 8, and 8. That seems to work 90% of the time, 90% of the planes. You can add more thinner, uh, and it's enough to do a plane, and the cost is still reasonable. It's not like you have to go invest $100 in material. Uh, yeah? Have you uh, looked at some of the, the uh, pigments that are available at the art supply stores that are, they have what seems to be pigment for acrylic paint? Is that, will that work with acrylic black? I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I think that's I tried it once. It was in a powder form. It didn't work too well. It didn't work. You've got to find out what the carrier is. See, the pigment is pigment is always pigment. Enamel pigment, pigment in art paint, pigment in house paint. Pigment is always pigment. But the carrier agent that they put it in, when they when they put it in a tube, they probably put it in uh, you know, some a chemical composition. Uh, in, in our case, if you're using all lacquers, great. No problem at all. You, you can mix and match from the family of lacquers pretty safely. Yeah, George. What use is gloss top coat? I don't even know what that is. It makes it the gloss top coat. I don't know if it's like the old common fuel proof. Yeah, common fuel stuff, stuff you paint on decals and that the was decals. Like and fun. You can take it and peel it right off, right? Yeah, it was saran wrap in a jaw. Yeah. <laughs> it makes this so cool. I never even ordered it for anybody. I don't know. Uh, if you Jimmy, find out. I think Jimmy was experimenting with it, but then he told me once he got like a gallon up or something. I don't know if he ever kept it up. I don't know. I, I'm really not familiar with the material. And, and I, like I said, I've, I've only worked with lacquer, and basically the reason, there's a lot of advantages to working with lead. There's no point in even talking about epoxies and neurons now, because it's, it's a, it's a, you can take a whole night to go to lead. When you work with lacquer, first off, you're not going to die. You might get sick, but you're not going to die. You can breathe in the fumes from this can if you worked at a shop with a with a with a used paint. You can you'll get headaches, you'll get all kind of stuff happening to you, but you will not die. You work in a place where they spray Imran, you're gonna die. Yeah. What's the truth about the, the phasing out color lacquer? I've heard that. Yeah, I've heard that. I heard it from Simo too. He went to buy paint. He said, "Oh, to buy it now because next year you can't buy." It. I don't. I charge them. Yeah. This is the New York. Yeah. yeah, it could be possible. Well, here's always yeah, the answer. A couple of supply houses I went to only had that. Some people went to DTZO, which is only a urethane. Yeah. Am By I the way, know? anybody knows anything that has the word urethane anywhere in it is toxic. I don't care what they put on a can. Go, go, you know, find a cat and spray it. Dead. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Imran, we know. Imran, I mean, is right on the can. It tells you, you know, it's, it's isocyanate and everything else. But I know, and, and I mean, I don't care what anybody tells you. If you have a material that you mix part A and part B with, any glue, any material, any polyurethane, any stuff you finish floors with, that's toxic stuff. That stuff, no matter how much, you know, they, they don't tell you, but it is all toxic. It's not, it gives you a headache. It kills you. I mean, and I know from this Imran thing, I was in a hospital for two weeks with Imran headaches and stuff. I know about this stuff. 
And it's not funny. And I always thought, ha, 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 you know, it's not going to catch me. But it, it will eventually get you. It's not a good idea to be using it. What are they using on the new car? They have, a, they have a material that they mix the clear coat and the color coat in one application and the clear floats to the top and the color sinks to the bottom and it's, it's real. It's, I, I've never tried to use it. So uh, it's but when I see the word More urethane, yeah, when you see the word urethane, it's, it's for professional people only. It's not toy for ten stuff. Well, that, that's a true urethane, not, not the stuff that you buy in, in the in yeah. can or something like that. That's, Polyurethane enamel. An Imron is a polyurethane enamel, and that means uh, anything that you add a hardener to. The, the tip off is when you add a catalyst, anything that you add a hardener to is going to be a problem. It's, it's going to be a toxic substance. Wait, Wendy, do you know anything about the PPG stuff that the Busso no. and the Pantry use? No, Bobby Hunt used it too on his new one, the one he did fly. That's, That's what they're using on cars. That's what he did. Yeah. And it runs out. It runs out. Suppose, and according to Busso, you can use a regular mask with it. But it's two parts. It's scary. I don't like anything with two parts. Anything with two parts, uh, you know. Now, and I know there's a guy in the room, and I'm, my friend George Ventrini that came down there, he works in, a, in an anodizing place. And there's all kind of chemicals and all kind of EPA stickers all over the place. And, and I've been to where they use epoxy paint. And there's more stickers on the walls. I guess they never have to paint. That, uh, there's, there's a lot of, and, and I don't know what the ratio is, like say if you use hobby epoxy glue, how much glue you have to use before it's toxic. But I know it's not good for you. I know it's not a, a substance that you want to just I painted my white boxes with hobby epoxy glue. The smell how high it goes, it die. Oh yeah, and use Black Baron in a spray can. Has anybody ever made Black Baron work in a spray can? No, uh, is there anybody? Now come on, let's be honest. You did. I did, I did, yeah. Give this man a watermelon. <laughs> Nobody has ever. I get one call a week. I've made a metal play with black. I never tried. It's fly paper. Hey, right there. Right there. Black, black baron. baron out of the black spring baron. Baron. I, I apologize. <laughs> I have never seen anybody. Yeah, and, and what happens is it's the old Lou Dudka thing of like a month goes by and the plane hasn't dried yet. And you got to grab it by the tail wheel and, you know, hang it on a wall. And it, I don't know what. I don't know what to tell people when that happens. The formula you will not try. you. Joe K used that stuff on one of his planes. Well, that's what ruined my comedian. My comedian. Oh, I don't want to hear about it. My comedian is more yellow every year. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's another nonsense product. That, that was the clear one that you put on it? Yeah, the formula you clear coat is because unless you have a yellow airplane. Yeah, or it is yellow eventually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The it actually works better on ours. Out in. Yeah. They're, I've heard uh, oh, yeah, the they're going to try great. to work with automobiles uh, actually make latex, a water base for painting cars eventually because... When I was a kid, I painted my mother's car with house paint. No, well, it's, it's, above, well, it's, good, it's a lot more. Might have come out great. Would you use rollers or brush? No, brush. No. no, I'm serious. I painted a car with house paint. It lasted a week. And it's no, well, they're, well, they're, well, they're trying to do is get away with all these toxic chemicals yeah. by using well, they have, base. It's the right the idea. Kind of things to lock the color in, then you won't. You I won't mean, let's be realistic. The idea, the idea of the EPA of, of everybody not buying and poisoning each is, is a good idea to begin with. But like everything the government does, at some point in time, it can get to be a little over. Over now, I've been to Georgia's shop with and. I guess the EPA isn't your favorite subject, don't you? But they can just kill a small business. If they knew, if God, if the government got a copy of this tape and they knew how much lack of thinner I throw into the toilet. <laughs> I mean, you know, the pipes in my house, they'll never rust. <laughs> never. And that's, you know, I don't know, I guess one of the byproducts of the hobby is you should try to keep it safe if you have a family and kids and everything. But on the other hand, uh, there's a map. I mean, nobody's going to die from breathing dope three days out of the year. I don't care if you paint your bed. Yeah. Somebody that, that uh, had a had a problem with with using dope, and supposedly they they experimented with using um, rustoleum that supposedly has less it's less aromatic, and uh, it supposedly is fuel proof up to about 15 percent. Uh, I think it's not it's very similar to this 21st century stuff that's come out. Yeah. It looks an awful lot like it because that 21st century, I've used it 
on, on one airplane, and uh, it sprays on pretty nice, and, and it does come up to a certain cost. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, uh, dry dull. Uh, so I have a feeling that it's, it's pretty close to, to rust holding. All right, and just so if anybody wants to know this, this is just information you might want to know. It has no practical application. The way a material is rated for shine, there's a direct relationship to how hard a material is and the shine it will give off when you bulk it out. If, if you have a material that's very flexible and soft, and I don't mean rubbery, I mean soft, uh, that it doesn't dry glass hard, it'll, it will not buff out the same as lacquer. The reason lacquer shines, and you can see the shine, and you can put your finger here and you can see your finger in it. And, and some materials won't do that, even though they look wet, like some of the, the uh, hobby box looks wet, can't see a finger in it. It doesn't have that same appearance. It's not a hard material. Hobby box is a soft material. Relative to lacquer, it's, it's probably twice as soft. You get the shine from it being hard. Why does a piece of glass shine and a piece of car uh, a piece of wood doesn't shine? It's hard, it's flat, it reflects the light. It's the light reflecting that causes the shine. Uh, there's a lot more of this information. Now, I don't know, Wayne, I think, still has the video on finishing. Uh, I spent about 15 minutes at a video describing why something shines and another material doesn't. Why does one a piece of graphite that's perfectly flat doesn't shine, a piece of glass that's flat does shine? And there's no point going into it now. There's about a 15 minute discussion. See Wayne, borrow the tapes, watch him and give him back. But if you understand the harder a material is, a diamond, okay, without, without even thinking, a diamond is a diamond. If you, if you put silly putty in the ring, it's not going to shine. Diamond shines because it's hard. You can make a flat surface and it reflects the light. So what we want, really, if you want the ultimate finish, is a rock hard finish, just flexible enough so that when the, when the airplane moves and bends, it doesn't break. And uh, you know, hopefully, that it's easy to do. That it's not a Jimmy Borelli. I didn't massage my wife full with the finish, you know, or whatever. The famous quote of the '91 that. <laughs> So anyway, anybody ask you? Something changed. His wife's a lot happier. I don't know. I'm only asking. Is that stuff hard and it shines and it's flat? Instant shine. Instant shine. Just don't get it wet because it peels off. Well, the downside of Morelli, now that's a good example. He had a plane that was painted, it was very heavy. The downside of monocoating the whole plane is the wind pull. So, I mean, you know, you got to weigh how much time did he save? Yeah, but he sanded the balls right off and down to the wall. Yeah. I just tried some of this finishing <laughs> on like Adam Pinkett. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, yeah. The drills will be new, I guess, right? Uh, it's been out for a couple of years, but it's, it's new relative to lacquer. Lacquer's been out since they, uh, you know, invested in horses. So. Anything I've done with, with any uh, fiberglass, like like John DeTavio had a demo with the, with the stab he had, I remember. The only downside I can see is it might be heavier than lacquer. When you're talking about a seven ounce to eight ounce finish on a big stunt ship, it's really got to be thin. The, that little sample of finish, squeeze it. You, you first time you paint epoxy, it's thicker than that whole finish. So you, you're all. It's really difficult. It's you know if if it's easy to make something shiny if it's a paint or a floor or a piece of plywood or a picture frame. Making it shiny is no no effort at all. Making it shiny and weighs seven ounces is a that Jimmy knows. I mean, anybody that builds control line such as knows how long it takes to make it light. It's not like if shiny was the only thing. Hey, we go put a gallon of water primer on it, it's gonna be shiny like that guy's Fury Jet. But make it light and shiny, now you now you're in another area of uh, you know. It's difficult to do, very difficult. To make a plane, now this yellow plane was 54 ounces, it was a big airplane, and it had a tuned pipe and it had oil. To make that airplane 54 ounces is like almost a miracle. You can't imagine how many times you have to sand it, how much, you know, everything is paper thin. It, uh, it's really a lot of work. Now to make that same plane 70, you could do it one weekend. That's just, you know, in Ron City, you know, just blow it up. So, Anyway, everybody's welcome to come up and uh, look at any of this, and when we're finished, we'll just throw it in the box and head out for some pizza, I guess. <laughs> Joe Ortiz said he's buying pizza. <laughs> 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 Can you predict that? <laughs> 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 Joe Ortiz. 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 Joe Ortiz.
I'm not even getting in this. Joe, let me tell you a trick. If we don't get down the restaurant by a certain, I don't know what the time is. There's one 24-hour restaurant. We went down a great night road. Get out of the traffic. Let's take it. Let's take it. Thank you. 